Well, this morning we celebrate a very, uh, a very significant day on the, uh, on the Christian calendar. It's, it's what we have come to know as, as Palm Sunday. Um, Palm Sunday is a very special uh, time of the year. Um, I was born on Palm Sunday, actually. Really, I, always say, I said to my mom, like, see, Jesus wasn't the only one that came to town uh, that day. Um, <laughs> but Palm Sunday is, is a very significant day on the Christian calendar. And uh, as you head out the, out the doors this morning, uh, for those who would like, we actually have palms for you to go and, and bring with you just to, just to commemorate uh, the significance of, of this day that took place in the life of Jesus. But to perhaps uh, fully appreciate uh, the significance of this, of this day, we would do well to consider all of the surrounding events that were um, taking place that made this day so memorable. It happened on a Sunday, but this was no ordinary Sunday. This was that holy time of the year in the Jewish calendar where many of the Jews from all over the land would come and, and gather. They would come and they would celebrate the Passover together. They would come and they would, they would celebrate the feast of the unleavened bread. And so they would come from, from all over the lands. History tells us that these festivals were so huge that it was not uncommon for three million Jews to gather in Jerusalem in this time of celebration, this time of, of looking back at what God has done for the Jews, as well as a time of looking forward to a time that God would once again send a deliverer to the Jews. And so they would reflect on God's faithfulness. They'd consider the many ways in which God led them uh, by fi with fire by night and, and by cloud by day, how God would provide fresh manna for them to eat. They'd consider how God delivered them from the harsh treatment of the Pharaohs, how God sent the many plagues upon the Egyptians because Pharaoh would not let God's people go. And so God rescued them. And deliverance came not because the Pharaoh changed his mind, but because God delivered them. And so they'd come and they, they'd celebrate God's faithfulness God's preservation of them over the centuries. And so these festivals that they, that they celebrated at this time, they serve two purposes. And we need to, it's really significant for us to appreciate Palm Sunday. It was a time, again, of looking back, and it was a time of looking forward. A time that God already delivered, and a time that God would send a deliverer. The prophets of old had all spoke about a Messiah who would come centuries before Jesus arrived on the scene. Prophets of old would speak about one who would come. Right in the beginning of Genesis in chapter 3, we see that God set in motion the plan of redemption by saying that one would come and would crush the head of the serpent, reversing the curse because of sin. And after that, we see all throughout the Old Testament like a, like a hand through the pages of the book that would point to one who would come. And so here they are. They are celebrating Passover. They are celebrating the feasts. And three million people are gathered in Jerusalem. I mean, you know, God knows how to set the stage for maximum impact. I mean, you couldn't get a better time, a better audience, a, a, a bigger crowd than this holy week on the Jewish calendar. And so we're going to take a look at that event from Luke's gospel. Uh, this, the, this occurrence that took place in the life of Jesus was um, one of those rare things that actually is recorded in, in all four of the gospels. Um, but we're going to take a look at it um, in, uh, through the lens of, of Luke's gospel. And so if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn together to Luke chapter 19. We're going to pick up at verse 28. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, speaking of Jesus. And when he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, 
Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. I love that. I love that. Let's just not let miss something here. If it's tied up, that means that somebody else owned it. <laughs> right? And so Jesus is like, all right, once you go into town, I want you to rip somebody off. Right? Somebody's got, a, somebody's got a cult out there. It's tied up. But you know what? I want you to go and I want you to take that, that, that cult. Uh, now, that might not land well in our culture today um, as socially acceptable. Certainly not something a religious leader would do. Uh, but this was something that was, ex- that was acceptable during those times. There was a custom called Angaria. That during, especially these holy times in the Jewish calendar, it was certainly appropriate for a religious leader to, um, to, to commandeer somebody's animal if it was being used for um, uh, sacred purposes. Okay, so what Jesus is asking his, his, his followers to do is not like breaking the law and stealing somebody's um, animal. It was, it was actually consistent. Um, and, and again, Jesus is, is setting the stage for them. And Jesus even says to him, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall, you shall say this, that the Lord has need of it. Now, it's interesting, this same word, Lord, that is translated in the English is the same word that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses for the word Yahweh. And so what Jesus is saying to them is, do you tell them, if anybody asks, why are you taking this? He said, you tell them, Yahweh has need of it. The stage is, is being set. And so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the ground. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. I love this. What he's saying here is before Jesus really even entered into the city, as he's still coming down the mountain, what they're doing is they're throwing their cloaks on the ground. It's ultimately, it's a, it's a symbolic uh, gesture on the, on the parts of the people who are praising him and saying, we will lay down our lives for you. And so as Jesus has not even entered the city yet, the crowds are starting to gather and it's catching the wind uh, in the ears of the people that are there and they are praising him for the wonderful deeds he had done. John's rendition of this exact story makes reference to the fact that many who were there that day were there when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, raised Lazarus from the dead. And so they knew that Jesus was no ordinary teacher, no ordinary rabbi. And so as Jesus neared the city, they start crying out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And I love this. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now there are many angles that we could consider uh, as we look at this passage of scripture. So many different things going on at this time, but I want us to consider for a moment what it must have been like for the people who were, who were present that day in Jerusalem. They gathered to look back at and to look forward to a deliverer, for a deliverer. That was their purpose of gathering. That's what drew the crowds in. It was a moment of, of looking back and looking forward. You see, they, they awaited a Messiah. They longed for one who would come and rule and, and, reign, and reign among them politically here on the earth. They weren't so much looking for the king of kings. They were just looking for a king that would give them some political clout with the people. And this Jesus was, a, was the perfect candidate. He was a miracle worker. Nobody questioned 
the fact that Jesus performed miracles. He was a phenomenal teacher. Anytime Jesus opened, opened his mouth, the crowds would hang on every word. They said nobody ever taught like he did. He had the attention of everybody in his day. And so when Jesus came to town, people listened. Their hopes were placed on the wrong guy. But their hopes were misplaced in the sense that they had no idea just who it really was who was in their midst. Their hopes were in the right person for the wrong reason. They had hoped that this one would come and would set up his kingdom here on the earth so that they would have political clout. They had no idea. And so for all intents and purposes, they, they were confused. That's the title of our message this morning. Confused. They were confused about the entrance into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. They would have preferred their, that their Messiah arrive into Jerusalem riding a, a white stallion, prancing upon a, 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 an enormous animal, a symbol of war and strength, but not Jesus. Jesus came riding on a donkey, and they were, they were confused. This animal that, that symbolized peace and, and not war, that's not what they were looking for. They were calling for war. They were laying their cloaks on the ground and saying, we'll stand with you, we'll die with you, take up the kingdom. But Jesus' gesture of riding on a donkey communicated that he had come in, in peace. And so they were confused. They wanted Jesus to come up with a, a plan to overthrow, the Ro overthrow Rome and be king. But he didn't do that. And so they were, they were confused. They thought God was going to deliver them because that's what the scripture said would happen. They hung on every prophetic word of the Old Testament that one was going to come and deliver them, but Jesus wasn't looking to deliver them politically, and they, they were confused. Why wouldn't he take up his rightful kingship here on the earth? How awesome that would be, Jesus. We outnumber, now's the time, we're all together. But Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to do, and so they were, they were confused. They, they waved palm branches. There was tremendous symbolism in, in that gesture. That's what would happen when a king arrived home victoriously from war. They would wave palm branches as the victorious king would enter into the city. Revelation talks about the new heaven and the new earth, where there will be a day where we will praise him who reigns forever. And it says in Revelation, we will praise him and wave palm branches. And so they waved their palm branches. But he didn't respond like a victorious king the way they had hoped he would. And so they were confused. In short, the Jews had who had longed for and, and waited for and anticipated for centuries. They were confused because God didn't do what they thought God should do. Now this is where having the luxury of, of, of knowing the entire story of the scripture can, can take away some of the impact for us, right? Because we know, we know what's happening on, on, on Friday, the following Friday and the, and the Sunday. And so um, it, it kind of takes some of the, the impact away. I submit to you that, that many of the Jews that worshiped Jesus that day were, were very confused that God didn't respond the way they hoped he would. However, many of the Jews that were confused that day would eventually go on to become the early church that we read about in Acts. 
that would bring the message of Jesus to all the world. But they didn't know that on Palm Sunday. They were yet to be let in on God's bigger plan of what, was God, of what God was, was doing. There was, a, there was a whole host of emotions that they would, they would go through in that upcoming week. But they were celebrating Passover. And now Jesus enters in and they realize our king is, our king is among us. But he is not doing what we think our king should be doing. And so many of the ones who cried out Hosanna on Sunday would cry crucify him on Friday. How quick the crowd changes. How quick people change when God doesn't do what they think God should do. They are praising him on Sunday and they are calling for his crucifixion on Friday. Their misplaced hope and confusion turned to anger as they called for Barabbas and said, crucify him. Now we're going to look at that Friday night as we consider the, the impact of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. That's Friday night. Be here. But getting back to our story, they, they didn't know what was ahead. They had hoped, they had planned, they had dreamed, they had anticipated, they had double-checked the things that spoke about him in the Old Testament, but they were, they were confused. And notice how, notice how Jesus responds to their confusion. Look with me at verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they'll tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because, here it is, you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't realize that all that the scriptures pointed to is in the process of unfolding before your very eyes. But did you catch what's going on here? They are cheering. They are pleading with him to take up his seat as king. They are throwing their cloaks on the ground as an act of, of loyalty to them. And Jesus weeps for them. They were confused. And Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Well, the destruction that was going to come was not, was not because Jesus was angry with them. But Jesus knew that it was the consequence of their rejection of him as Jehovah God. And that's exactly what happened. Destruction certainly came in AD 70. Years later, over the course of 143 days, the Romans came in and they killed 600,000 Jews, carried away so many more as slaves, and they destroyed the temple. But Jesus not only wept because of the consequences that were sure to come, but Jesus wept because they didn't get it. They misunderstood all that was spoken of about the Messiah. They were confused that day as they cried out, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus wept for them because Jesus Love them. We, we, we need to understand and embrace the humanity of Jesus. We need to recognize that, that yes, while he was fully God, he was fully man as well. 
And as he entered into Jerusalem, he saw the crowd and he, he wept over them. John talks about the fact that he saw them as, as sheep without a shepherd. They were, they were confused about what God was doing. You ever been confused about what God is doing in your life? You ever wonder why God is allowing something to be introduced into your life and you think to yourself, God, why is this happening? Lord, take this away. And there's silence. God, this isn't the way I thought it was going to be. This isn't how I saw myself. This wasn't the plan. Why aren't you doing what I think you should be doing? I'm sure that we've all had those times in our life where we have wondered, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you responding to my tears and my confusion? And we wonder, God is at work. You remember the story of Job tells us that. We consider this godly man of old who wondered. He was a righteous man. And the scriptures tell us that Satan came and presented himself before God. And God is bragging about Job. And then he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the land. Do you remember the story? And Satan says, well, of course there's nobody like him in all the land. You've been so good to him. You've provided for all of his needs. And in a short amount of time, God uses Job as a lesson that man will serve God just for God. And in a matter of days, moments, Job loses his family. He loses his home. He loses his wealth. He loses his health. And here is Job now in a time of mourning in sackcloth and ashes. One minute everything was going well, but now his world has turned upside down and he is crying out to God all throughout the book of Job. It's a great story for us to consider. But ultimately his cry is, God, why am I going through this? When will things change? God, where are you? And as we get further into the, about the 23rd chapter of Job, as Job is still in, in that moment of, of wondering what God is doing, he comes full circle and he realizes, he says, I look to the north, the south, the east, and the west, and he said, I don't see him. I don't perceive him. I don't know what he's doing. He said, but I know something. He knows the path that I take. And when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. You see, we learn from the lesson of Job that there's things that are going on beyond our understanding, that God has not forgotten. He is not malicious. He doesn't get his kicks out of watching his children suffer. But when there's times where we don't understand what God is doing, it's in those moments that we must trust the goodness of God. Why? What does one do when when God doesn't respond the way we think he ought to respond. Perhaps like the Jews that wanted a temporary political king. Perhaps God is looking to do more than we we're ever even asking for. You see, the Jews wanted a political king. They were shooting way too low. Their expectations were way too low. And God is like, no, we're going to do something a little bit bigger than that. I'm, I'm bigger than the king of Israel. The heavens are my throne. The earth is my footstool. You see, they had no idea that God was doing something far grander than they could ever imagine. Isaiah reminds us that, that God's ways are are higher than our ways. His thoughts are transcendent over our thoughts. That means that when God doesn't respond the way that we, we think he should, 
that we as his followers then need to yield to his plan and use that as an opportunity to learn how to trust him. Let those moments of tears become opportunities to say, God, teach me to trust you in these difficult situations. And life throws curveballs, doesn't it? Sometimes we find ourselves in situations we never thought possible. And we cry out to God, God, change my circumstances. And God's like, no, I'm going to change you in those circumstances. Those things that you plead to God to remove from your life, if you only knew those are the very tools in the hands of your loving father who's committed to making you more and more into the image of Jesus. And if we really embrace that and recognize that, while it would not necessarily take the pain away for the moment, it helps us to realize that there's a purpose far bigger than our limited understanding could, could ever embrace. Have you ever been confused? We've all been in that season. Trust the one who is at work in your life for your good. He's so trustworthy. You know, the disciples would have never known that God can, that Jesus could, could calm a storm unless they got in a boat and got placed into a storm. I mean, Jesus, Jesus just could have said, I can, I can calm the storm. And that would have landed really well in their, in their ears. But when they got out in the boat, and when they got scared, and when they had to look their own mortality in the face, and they see Jesus come in and say, peace, be still, and that storm settles. It's like, oh, he really does, he, he calms storms. He's bigger than our storm. And you see, God is more concerned about our, 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 our ability to um, experience what he's doing than to just intellectually assent to what he's capable of doing. It's hard to argue against an experience, but I know so many of you, you've been through the storm and you've come out the other side and you've said, you know, it wasn't fun, I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> but I love him more than I've ever loved him before. I trust him more than I've ever trusted him before. I wonder if I ever really even did trust him before. You see, that's what, that's what God does. It's not something any of us look forward to. However, if we will use those moments of confusion as a tool to pursue God, and isn't it interesting what comes out during those times, by the way? I don't know about you, but I, I come face to face with my belief that I've got rights. When God's not doing what I think he should be doing, I'm like, I deserve you to do this. And I'm like, oh, that's really, they don't, you, you're just as bad as I am, right? <laughs> don't look at me like you can't understand that. <laughs> Hypocrites. <laughs> but you know what, isn't it true in those moments that we come face to face with the ugliness of what's on the inside? But you know what? Those moments are the only tools that will get the ugliness out. God brings us through those times and we look at this and we say, oh Jesus, I'm so sorry. I can't believe that's there. Will you take this from me? And it's like Jesus is saying, yeah, that's why I brought you through that storm. Palm Sunday is many, many things. It's the triumphal entry of Jesus into the streets of Jerusalem. It's the fulfillment of age old prophecy that that our king would be arriving on the scene on that very day. It was an indictment against the Jews for not knowing the day of their visitation. It was a revelation of the crowd's heart that wanted a temporary kingdom even over an eternal one. But as we saw today, when God doesn't respond the way we think he should and we're left a little confused, Palm Sunday serves as a reminder that, that God is aware of where we're at. 
And he's doing something far grander than we could ever imagine. I'm sure that there are many of the Jews that day who were confused, especially as they saw their Savior die on the cross. That when he rose from the dead, and he walked among us afterwards for those 40 days. I'm sure many of those who were in the crowd on that same Palm Sunday, as they cried out then, Hosanna in the highest, oh, did it have a much more significance to their praise. I'm sure they thought, oh, that's what he was talking about. That kind of a kingdom, that kind of a king, that kind of a God, this kind of a people. And there will be a day, as Revelation says, that we will gather on the final Palm Sunday with every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we will gather with all of the redeemed in the presence of God and all of his holy angels. And we will once again experience Palm Sunday, that moment once again where we will stand before the lover of our souls and cry out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord, praise be to his awesome, awesome name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for how you use the pages of the past to speak to our present. How we can see even in moments like that day Jesus arrived into Jerusalem. How the people were confused because you didn't do what they thought you should do. We thank you that we have the ability to see beyond that moment and see ultimately what you were doing. Just like that was the case in Job's life. Lord, help us to apply that which we see and learn from the past right now to the present. Father, I stand in the presence of my brothers and the sisters, many of which may be right there right now, where they love you, but they're saying, God, why? Why am I going through this? Why don't you change it? I pray that this word would be anointed by your spirit and that it would spring hope in their hearts that you are above time. You are not bound by time. You're not working in the, on one thing at a time. You're doing so much more. And help us to realize that the one who loves us most is working in our hearts and is committed to our sanctification. We thank you, Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would allow the truths that we looked at in your word continue to preach and encourage us throughout the course of this week. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.